Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third lecture in my series, Music, Imagination and Experience in the Medieval World. And the title of today's lecture is To Sing and Dance. Now, I began my last lecture with the life of a saint. Well, this time I open with something that you might think is, it, is it really is even more unlikely to reveal anything much about the lighter and more festive sides of medieval music and experience singing and dancing. I'm referring to a dossier that was assembled early in the 14th century to make a case for the canonization of a particular English bishop. Now, although the, the Catholic Middle Ages have long been presented in Protestant tradition, haven't they, as, and not only there, in fact, as a time of superstition and mystification, I think nothing falsifies that picture quite like the painstaking and even, you might say, forensic way in which monks and clergy assembled the materials to support their claim that someone from their diocese or monastery deserved to enter the ranks of the blessed and be canonized. Our candidate for sainthood in this instance, instance is Thomas Cantilupe, Bishop of Hereford, who died in the year 1282. As you might expect, especially if you heard my last lecture in the series, a great deal of this canonization dossier is concerned with the miracles of healing that Thomas is supposed to have performed. Now, one of these counts, presented, I think, with almost legalistic care and attention to detail, casts a shaft of light upon events one Sunday in the rural parish of Marsden, approximately five miles from the city of Hereford during the season of spring. I'm going to read you an extract from the deposition of a witness who was called before the procurator of the chapter of Hereford and a Roman delegation that was present. Now, I quote, the witness stated that about 15 years or more ago, around the time when rumors were going about concerning the miracles God was said to have performed through Master Thomas, it happened one Sunday in April, before the feast of the Martyr of St. George, that's 23rd of April, that there was a certain beer tavern in the parish from which the witness came, that's to say of Marsden, in the house of someone called Water de la Weil. The witness went with his wife, Cecilia, to that inn after the service of knowns, along with a good hundred people, or thereabouts, from the aforementioned parish. When they went to the inn, they left in their home, along with her other brother and sisters, their daughter, Joanna. But when they came close to the inn, they saw Joanna, who was then about five years old, was following them. They weren't concerned, because there were many other neighbor's children there. But after Joanna had been standing for a little while in the said inn with the other children, in the presence of the witnesses and many others, she went out of the inn with the other children and entered the garden where there was a pool used as a fishery or fish pond. It ran to a depth of about six feet or thereabouts and there was a broad ditch 24 feet across and about 60 feet long. Joanna went into this garden, approaching the pool, and started to throw pebbles into it. But while she was throwing stones into the pool, a certain John, who was the same age as Joanna, pushed her towards the pond in order to frighten her. She fell into the water, and she sank beneath the surface. The witness and the others were unaware of what had happened, for according to their custom and their manner, once they'd finished their drinking, the young members arranged themselves into a dance or carol and wound their way through the garden near to the ditch into which the said Joanna had sunk. Some people in the carol saw the girl's clothes in the water and saw her lying motionless at the bottom, and they believed it was the daughter of Christine de Greenaway, who came from the same parish and who was a destitute woman along with her daughter and that because of the anguish of poverty and misery, Christine de Greenaway had thrown her daughter into the ditch. Well, I end the quotation there with that almost horrific evocation of a woman so poor that she drowns her daughter. Needless to say, the miracle that Thomas of Hereford performs in this case is to restore the drowned child 
Joanna to life. And since my theme today, as I said at the beginning, is song and dancing, I'm sure you can see why I've lingered over that report. It gives a really exceptional glimpse of a dance taking place one day, long ago, in a medieval village. And it all happens because the young people, according to their custom, are dancing in the garden of a long gone Herefordshire tavern. Well, such dances performed in a ring or a line, often with the dancers holding hands and singing, were commonly called carols, as in that example. And they really were a constant feature of medieval English life and in many other countries in the villages and towns. Now, you have an illustration of one from an Italian source on your handout, and I'll return to the question of why the picture shows only women. You'll not be surprised to hear that the civil and ecclesiastical authorities often disapproved of these dances, and we're dealing here, I think, with something very ancient in the civilization of the Middle Ages. Indeed, you might say something almost pre-medieval. In the year 597, for example, the clergy who gathered for the Third Council of Toledo in what was then the Visigothic Kingdom of Spain, fulminated against what they called an impious custom that the people often observe on feast days of the saints and which is utterly to be stopped. Those who should be at divine service keep watch with dances and obscene songs, not only harming themselves, but also disturbing the offices of the churchmen. This holy synod commits this matter to the care of the bishops and judges so that this custom be banished from all Spain. Note the reference there to keeping watch. Christian holy days, like those of the Jews on which they're based, begin the evening before. So these dances were nocturnal affairs, vigils, that's to say, through the night hours with fires and torches while the clergy and monks were trying to sing their night office. Well, trained musicians of the Middle Ages, insofar as we know their views, were inclined to look down on the music performed for such dances, which was, no doubt, relatively simple, tuneful and rhythmic, as dance music often is. There's only one explicit remark from such a musician working and writing in England, as far as I know, and we find his comment in an early 15th century commonplace book where he mentions what he calls rondels, ballads, carols and springes, where springes are presumably some kind of leaping or springing dance. He says, I don't need to discuss the music of these because they are fantastical and frivolous and no composers of music have exerted their art or knowledge upon their texts. Well, fortunately for us, that author was quite wrong. You'll remember the gospel story of the massacre of the innocents, the children whose murder was ordered by Herod in the hope that the newborn king would be found and killed in the general horrific massacre. The Catholic Church of the Middle Ages celebrated the Feast of the Holy Innocents on 28th of December. It's part of the, the Christmas liturgy. Most great churches had their staff of choir boys, often called the Innocents or the Innocentes. Now, the song you're about to hear was written for that feast and was to be sung, I strongly suspect, by the choir boys and altar servers and quite possibly to be danced as well, for the tradition of clerical dance in the Middle Ages was far richer than you might suspect. The text runs, Let our company of boys, rejoicing with great joy, celebrate and song and dance this anniversary feast. In honour of the innocents, let harps and drums sound, let songs and instruments witness to a happy mind. Rightly festive, let us rejoice and be merry with the court of heaven. Aya, let sport and gladness, laughter, peace and courtesy make up our household. Boys, let us rejoice, Herod is dead. We have conquered, our enemy is overcome. Suffering eternal torment, he will not be able to rise again. And we shall follow the immortal lamb wherever he may go. Rightly festive, let us rejoice and be merry with the court of heaven. Aya, let sport and gladness, laughter, peace and courtesy make up our household. Magno cadens cardio nostra puericia, salat cum tripudio proptec natalia, ad honorem innocentum sonet lire timpana, litimentis argumentum canto sitet orga. 
In medieval England, the carols or dances were often performed in churchyards, which is another, in fact, very ancient practice. It was in such open spaces, and especially to the land around ecclesiastical foundations, churches, monasteries, and so on, abbeys, that the dancers in the towns and cities tended to congregate. The author of one treatise against these dances specifically attacks the dancers for choosing a place dedicated to saints, while the French Dominican friar Guillaume Pairaut, whom we'll be hearing from again, uh, because he's the author of the most elaborate of all the surviving tracts against these dances, declares that the, those who perform them do grave offence to a saint when they dance in a place dedicated to him or her. An anonymous treatise on confession, which is now in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, confirms the suspicion that these places dedicated to saints were often the cemetery lands around churches for the author in vase, as you, you might think he well could, against carols performed, and I quote, around the bodies of the dead. There's a wonderfully revealing story from the later 12th century which tells of a priest in the Diocese of Worcester who was trying to sleep one night, but he couldn't because the dancers in the churchyard were singing the same dancing song in English over and over again with a refrain which kept coming back. The author I'm following for this story, Gerald of Wales, actually breaks out of the Latin in which he's telling the story to give the text of that refrain in the English vernacular. It was sueta le mandinara, my beloved, your favor. The next day, and I, I think you may be ahead of me with this, the next day when the priest was standing at the altar for mass and the moment arrived for him to sing, Dominus for hobby his cum, instead of singing that, he sang, yes, of course you've guessed it, Sueta le mandinara. We don't have the music for that, I just made it up, which caused a public scandal. The Bishop of Worcester banned that song from being sung in his diocese, a ban, I'm sure, that was singularly ineffective, but which shows how a song and a dance could be a dangerous thing. These carols were company dances and often uh, prearranged events which took place on or near the feast days of saints as an informal and, if you like, a carnivalesque counterpart to the official celebrations of the church's services and seeking out the same spot of holy ground. Remember that the dance described in the dossier for the canonization of Bishop Thomas Cantilupe took place on the Sunday before St. George's Day, a detail which I think is just as significant as the late, late April and therefore springtime setting of the events described. The presence of the dead, who were after all not really dead for contemporaries, was no disincentive. I'm reminded here irresistibly of the last stanza of Philip Larkin's remarkable poem, Church Going, on the residual power of a church, even for those who are not devout. Let me give you a few lines. A serious house on serious earth it is, in whose blend air all our compulsions meet, are recognized and robed as destinies, 
and that much never can be obsolete, since someone forever will be surprising a hunger in himself to be more serious and gravitating with it to this ground which he once heard was proper to grow wise in, if only that so many dead lie round. To find out more about the dances of the medieval squares, churchyards, and streets, you, you, as you can imagine, we turn to the writers who disapproved of them so strongly that they can't resist giving details of what it was they loathed, and we're very grateful to them for that. In other words, we've got much to learn from those who denounce the dancers in their sermons, treatises on the seven deadly sins, or in their manuals of confession, to look no further. Here, as a, an illustration, is a cautionary tale preserved by the Dominican friar Thomas of Cantimbray in his collection of stories called the Bonum Universale di Apibus, which he completed in the year 1263. I think it reveals the kind of material that many such works preserve, but it also shows how information bearing upon the social history of music in the Middle Ages is often to be found in places where really it is least to be expected. And I think that's possibly the guiding theme of what much of what I have to say in this season of Gresham Lectures. The mere title of his work, A Universal Prophet Extracted from the Study of Bees, is enough, you might think, to make it seem very unlikely to be a source of information about dancing, but the location of the material within the book is more surprising still for it appears in a section on fortune-telling or clairvoyance. I quote, Here is a cautionary tale of a physician who predicted that a girl singing sweetly was about to die, and by means of it I shall prove that men of great skill can predict the future. There was a count of Lersbrück in the province of Brabant named Ludwig, who had a highly expert physician in his household. <coughs> One day, when his passage through a certain town led him by a carol, a girl with a beautiful face and a wonderful sweetness of voice was leading the dance. The Count crossed the town with his retinue and admired her exceedingly for an hour. When the physician saw him in this reverie, he said, You marvel, Count, at the voice and beauty of the woman who leads the dance. You should rather marvel that she's about to die. These words were scarcely out of the physician's mouth when a mighty wailing went up in the town and he learned, having sent messengers there to find out, that the girl had suddenly collapsed and died. An English theologian of the early 14th century, the Dominican friar John Brumyard, records one of the most revealing stories about the carol. In his manual for preachers, entitled Summa Predicantium, an encyclopedia for preachers, if you like, Bronyard tells how some saintly men approached a certain city. I quote, They saw a demon sitting upon the ramparts, and when he was asked why he sat there alone, he replied, I don't need the help of anyone, because all the city is obediently subject to us, the forces of the devil. Entering the city, they found the population in a state of greatest dissoluteness, that is to say, dancing carols and occupied with diverse other entertainments. Terrified, they left the city. Given that my overarching theme is the sheer unlikeliness of the places where we can find information about medieval musical life and practice, I'd like to continue excavating pieces of music with a dance connection from corners where, frankly, we really wouldn't expect to find it. You're now going to hear a melody embedded in a three-part composition of the 13th century, again with a text in Latin, that celebrates <clears throat> the passage of the Israelites over the Red Sea. Given the shape of the melody and the way it keeps returning to a refrain, I suspect that the composer was thinking of the dance of Miriam with her timbrel and fellow female dancers, which the account in Exodus 1520 places after the safe crossing of the Red Sea. Here's the text in translation. Free from mud and brick, the Hebrew freely passes over. A new man marked with a new sign, on dry foot with a pure mind, the Hebrew freely crosses, cleansed by the waters of baptism. Sortis tributum miseri, 
The texts that we have say little about the actual choreography of carols, and there was perhaps no single way of dancing them. I think that's very likely. To judge by scattered references in sermons, for example, the dances might be convened in various ways. Uh, by a minstrel playing a wind instrument that everyone could hear in a noisy town, by someone beating a drum, or by the appointed leader of the dance calling out through the streets, a la touche de caroles, to the touching of hand-holding of carols. Once convened, it's clear the dance could take various forms. That's quite certain. No doubt the place chosen for actually doing the dance was a decisive factor in establishing <coughs> the actual shape that it assumed. In some contexts, for example, there was, as you could imagine, there was an abundant room for a common location for these dances, often mentioned by the moralists with disquiet, is a public square or platea, giving us the French word place, meaning, let's say, a market square. We also read of dances in the thoroughfares, which explains why an anonymous preacher adorns his section on the carol, that is to say, a section against the carol, with Ecclesiasticus uh, chapter 9, verse 7, do not look around you in the streets of the city. On these occasions, it would often have been impractical to dance in a ring, so we can understand why Guillaume Paidout refers to what he calls the procession of the carol, and why another author talks about it as a processio diabolica, a diabolic procession, suggesting that the dances were sometimes formed in the kind of line that narrow medieval streets would often have required. When the place chosen was a churchyard, though, or a town square, giving a little bit more room, the carol often took the form of a ring. And the sermons are very explicit about this detail. According to Guillaume Paidout, whom I'm relying upon a good deal, as you can tell, this uh, Dominican friar, the dancers moved in a circular motion, mortu circulari. And the basic position was for the dancers to hold hands, whence the call I mentioned earlier, a la touche de carolas, a detail which moralists such as Piedout found particularly disturbing. You can see this on the handout. The touching of hands constituted one of the formal categories of sin which carolers committed, a sin of physical contact. But it's clear that the clasping of hands was sometimes undone. The hands were released for clapping, accompanied by stamping, Whence Pirout's use of Ezekiel, chapter 25, verse 6, because you have clapped with your hands and stamped with your feet. You'd be amazed, incidentally, I have been, quite how much of the Bible the preachers and homilists found useful when they attacked these dances, often in quite detailed and specific ways. The circular motion of the dance, which led to the left, could certainly sometimes be interrupted, to judge by Pirout's reference to dances that go back and forth to the right and to the left. Now, on great feast days of the year, the dance could become a major public event, and the preachers attack the way that young women preen themselves for the occasion. You can picture it, can't you? The amount of detail in their polemics is really extraordinary and is a, a wonderful set of uh, information about uh, medieval social life. We hear of girls adorning themselves with wigs made from the hair of dead women painting their faces and accepting garlands from their sweethearts. Some even wore pearls to the dance, according to one moralist, and those unable to adorn themselves in this way looked on with jealous eyes, blushing, as he says, with shame and envy. But it would be wrong, not very wrong, but wrong, <clears throat> to present the carol as an entertainment restricted to the young, though that's certainly what we met in the story about the parish of Marsden, with which I began. 
The social meaning, if you like, of these dances was really more comprehensive than that. Sermons and treatises on the seven vices, where carols are often discussed under the heading of illicit desire or luxuria, reveal that old women sometimes took their place in the dances as well. Usually, however, the moralists say that the carol was too strenuous for them. The English Dominican John Brumyard, whom I've mentioned before, he's a very good and eloquent witness, reveals that old women were usually content to lead the girls to the dance, but stopped there, just as old knights led young squires to the field and stopped there, while another account cruelly confirms this picture, adding that these wrinkled old women lend their dancing clothes to the young girls. Presumably the clothes were more traditional than fashionable. Well, since the carols were closely associated with holidays granted for the feasts of the most important saints of a region, and since carols often seem to have taken place in an urban environment, it is possible that many different social classes came together in them. The daughters of peasant families in town for the holiday and middle-class women with the husbands among the burgesses. Did the, the, did the daughters of local nobles take part? Well, a passage in a sermon by the Franciscan Nicolas de Bayer suggests that the daughters of good, indeed noble families, did not join the carols in the town, but rather stayed at home. But I think this is really wishful thinking on his part. He writes, a noble dog, while others fight in the town, will sit at home peacefully and remain silent. So noble girls, daughters brought up in the most respectable fashion, will stay in the house sitting and praying while others sing a carol. One rather unexpected side of the carol emerges when we recognize how frequently and throughout the Middle Ages, the dance songs that were sung were often apparently composed by women and were satirical, satirical or as we might now say, political. A 12th century life of the Anglo-Saxon rebel Heriwood the Wake reports that, and I quote, the people of the region of Ely praised Heriwood above all others, women and girls sang of them in their carols. We might compare this passage from the 13th century life of Saint Arnold of Villiers. One day a wanton and impudent woman came to him saying that she wished to improve her condition, subject to him wishing to help her in the necessaries of life. He, keen for the salvation of a neighbour, agreed to her request and gave what he could to the woman. She, however, going away, mocked the simplicity of the man, composed a song about him and sang it, leading a carol. Indeed, according to Guillaume Pairaut, the refrain of one carol sung by young women was Pauvre Marie, fie, fie on you, wretched husband. Well, for the history of lyric and song in medieval England, one of the most important aspects of the carol is their use of a refrain, a recurring section of music and poetry quite distinct from the verse. I really want your ears to seize this without you actually seeing the text printed out. So here again, are two verses of Magno Gaudens Gaudio. Magno Gaudens Gaudio, nostra puerizia, salat country pudio, protec natalia, ad honorem innocentem, sonent lirit in pana, litipentis argumentum, canto Jure festi cum celesti curia, gratulemo et letemo eia, nostra sint familia, jocos et letizia, risus pax et gadia, cum peni gloria. Gaudia. Let it see 
Jesus Pax et gratia, cum perenni gloria. Many of the manuals that were written for the use of priests uh, and friars who were required or licensed to hear confession reveal the church's battle against the carol from the front line. These handbooks sometimes give lists of questions which confessors are to put to penitents during confession. So here are some of the very words which laymen, laywomen in the cities and villages heard as they knelt to be shriven the pleasures of the carols seeming very remote, perhaps even dreamlike, in the necessary discomfiture of the moment. So, for example, in the section entitled Concerning Pride, the priest or friar must, I quote, inquire whether the penitent has celebrated carols, which may be done in many ways, in assembling together, in buying fine clothes, in disturbing young girls, and in doings of this kind. Carols come into view a second time when the confessors turn to the sin of luxuria, not quite the same as lust, but certainly encompassing it. There, amidst questions about visiting prostitutes and courting widows, we find these pointers to a confessor's catechism. Inquire whether the penitent has polluted himself with a prostitute, deflowered a virgin, or visited a widow. Inquire also whether the penitent has taken part in carols much, or in spectacles of this kind, and delighted in others. Well, as you can tell, in the eyes of many churchmen, the carol was a diabolic substitute for the holy liturgy, often celebrated on the same day. One story tells that there was once a certain young man who was the most devoted of carolers, and for this reason, he liked to take part in every one that was going forward, perhaps obeying that summons a la touche de carolers heard in the streets. Since his parents were in danger of being brought to poverty by this, presumably because of his expenditure on clothes or on girls whom he met there, they shut him up in a high chamber and locked him in chains. In that same hour, a carol passed through the street and the young man leading it was in every way like their son, but it was actually Satan himself. The parents, not realizing that this diabolical impersonation was taking place and thinking that their son must have broken out of his captivity, ran to the chamber and there they found him chained up as before. Astonished, they came angrily to the carol, calling out to the young man that he revealed his identity. And he did, with due candor. I am the devil, whose liturgy your son used to perform. And since you hold him bound in chains so that he can no longer conduct this liturgy, he was wont to celebrate with such keenness, I'm doing it for him and for myself. Strange though it may seem, some parents actually encourage their children to attend. Pyrout tells how mothers adorned their daughters and led them to the dance, for example. Special clothes, floral garlands in the hair, the generous application of striking facial cosmetics, these and other details recorded in the sermon literature suggest that carols often functioned as a marriage market in which young girls of marriageable age had the license, so to speak, to attract potential suitors, to pull them into the dance, to make a play for them. Well, I end with something that may have been in your minds all along, especially since it will soon be Christmas. Surely all these references to carols have something to do with the Christmas carols we know and love. Well, yes, they do, in a way. These dances gave rise to a common form in Middle English poetry, where the poem begins with a refrain, has a verse, goes back to the refrain, has a verse, and so on. The rule being that you almost begin with a refrain, alternate refrain and verse, and must end with a refrain. So there's always a chorus to start, there's always a chorus to end, and between every verse, there's a chorus. This is what medieval English poets knew as carol form. And there were indeed carols of Christmas, as of many other festivals, such as Easter and Pentecost. As you can imagine, the alternation of refrain and verse strongly suggests that it has its origins in the dancing songs, where the company would sing the chorus of the song and the soloist reply with the verses. So here to end, and to draw you towards Christmas, is one of the finest of the medieval English carols with its original music. And I'm going to read you 
the text in Middle English before you hear it sung. Lulai, lulai, lai, lai, lulai, mi der mother sing lulai. Als I lay on Julis nicht alone in Milonging, me thought he saw a well fire sick the my her children king. Lulai, lulai. The maiden wall with Uten's song her children sleep bring. The child him thought she did him wrong and bade his mother sing. Lulai, lulai. Sing now, mother, said the child, what shall do me befall? Hereafter, when he come to hell, for so don mother's all. Lulai. Lulai. Swear to sunna say the share, whereof I shall thee sing. No wist he never yet more of there but Gabriel's great inger. Lulai, lulai. He great me godly on his clare, and said a heil Maria. Heil full of grass, God is with there, do bear and shalt me see. Lulai, lulai. He wandered Michel in me thought, for man while he rich nunna. Mary has said a dread de nacht, that God of heaven alone. Lulai, lulai. Der as has said a ide bar on midwinter nicht, in maiden head with uten car be grass of God al micht. Lulai, lulai. Der shepherds waked in the wall, thy her the wonder mirtha, of angels there as them thy told the teeding of the birtha. Lulai, lulai. Certainly, this sick he say, this song he heard the sing, as Amy lie, this Yule is die, alone in me longing. Yeah. 
Zeiten 